Um, I wanted to say a quick word uh, on the end of the notices about lay preachers. Uh, we've been asked by the circuit to mention the work of, uh, of lay preachers uh, in the Methodist Church. And um, I, I'm very happy to do that, actually, because I think it's one of the things that really distinguishes Methodism from other denominations uh, in this country, uh, is the, uh, the way in which uh, folk who often have different jobs and different professions uh, find themselves in the pulpit uh, on Sundays, um, and, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, my father was a lay preacher, he was a doctor and missionary in North Africa, uh, and I've been a, a lay preacher since 2015. And uh, I think it's, it's a very, very exciting um, uh, calling, uh, because it basically exposes folk in, in pews to preaching from folk who are just doing everyday jobs uh, and, and living lives which are uh, not full-time ministry, uh, although I suppose you could argue we're all doing full-time ministry, but uh, are often working you know, in all sorts of different professions and jobs uh, and yet are on Sunday bringing God's word to people. Uh, and uh, that has a, a bite and an application, I think, uh, which can be very, very helpful for ordinary folks wanting to just look, look, learn more about God's word. So uh, I want to highlight that and invite you to think about whether that might be something you'd be interested in. Uh, the, the Methodist uh, program of training lay preachers is very thorough, so you get a lot of opportunity to learn about theology uh, and the Bible, uh, but also you just get a lot of time to uh, practice preaching. Um, and certainly I find it a, a great blessing. So a quick word about that. Why don't we bow our heads uh, and pray together? <coughs> our Father, thank you for being able to meet and join together as your people on this Sunday. And we praise you and thank you for the way that you've kept us this week. And we pray that you'd help us today as we spend worshiping, as we say, sing songs to you and each other, as we pray prayers, as we reflect on your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us and that you'd be uh, amongst us, uh, moving us on as people, as your people of God. Amen. Uh, let's stand and sing a, a song together. Great sing a, a hymn of praise, the splendour of the King, as we get our service started. Let's stand and sing this.
Amen. How great is our God. Our Father, we thank you for your greatness as we reflect on you and take ourselves away from our own struggles and concerns and worries just for a moment, just to reflect on you and who you are. And we thank you from our experience that you are a good God, a God that has no evil or wrong, a God who is full of mercy, who is prepared to give people a second chance. Lord, we don't deserve your goodness, and yet still it's on offer. And we praise you for that. We thank you for your loving kindness, your ability, like a prodigal father, to wait for us, <clears throat> to catch up, to see the foolishness of our ways sometimes. Your patience, the way you are prepared to play a long game, always ready for us to return to you when we drift, when we go down wrong routes. We praise you that you wait patiently. We thank you for your justice, that you are not some cosmic Christmas, uh, Father Christmas, but a God who, right, for whom right and wrong is important that you long for everyone to enjoy protection and safety, particularly those who are vulnerable, liable to be exploited. And we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control of our lives rather than us. And the longer we go through life, we recognize what a mess we'd make of our lives if we were in charge. We thank you for that wisdom, Lord. Accept, O oh Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendour of the whole of creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life and for the mysteries of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for sending us tasks that demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments that satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying, through which he conquered death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him, at all times and in all places, may we give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Let's sing, say the Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to have two readings now. I'm reading Psalm 57. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who will fulfil his purpose for me. He will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. My God will send forth his unfailing love and faithfulness. 
I am surrounded by fierce lions who greedily devour human prey, whose teeth pierce like spears and arrows, and whose tongues cut like swords. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. My enemies have set a trap for me. I am weary from distress. They have dug a deep pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is confident in you, O God. My heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. Wake up, my heart. Wake up, O lyre and harp. I will wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. For your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. Amen. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 7. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little, little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people into sin. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? Thank you very much. We're going to explore that second passage a little bit later on. Uh, but now let's uh, stand and sing another song together. Uh, Seek ye first the words, I think, of Francis Assisi. Um, uh, to put to music uh, from um, that passage in Matthew. Let's stand and sing this together.
let's spend some time praying uh, for our our community, our city, our country, and our world. Our Father, we want to pray for the world that you've created and acknowledge that it's in a mess and we want to pray for that world. We want to pray for peace. We hear on our screens regularly uh, news of conflicts, particularly in Ukraine, but also in other parts of the world, tensions in the Far East, uh, places in Africa. Lord, we ask that you would help leaders to find solutions, that those countries would become peaceful again. We pray against the kind of aggression that we see in the Ukraine, where one powerful man seeks to expand his influence. And we pray for peace, particularly in that country. Lord, we pray also for the environmental disasters uh, that we see around the world as well. Lord, we confess that we have not been good stewards of your world. And we pray that you give us wisdom as Christians as to how to best try and play our part in reducing the environmental problems of our world. Father, we pray that leaders would have wisdom, that they would find a way of putting aside short-term gains for the long-term health of our world. And Lord, we want to pray particularly for this country. Lord, we're seeing huge amounts of tension in terms of disputes and strikes and conflict. Uh, Lord, we ask for wisdom for those parties that are in dispute at the moment. We pray for our government and we pray for union leaders and we pray for ordinary uh, people in jobs who are making decisions as to whether to go on strike or not. We recognise the damage that some of those strikes are doing to our health uh, of an, as a nation, the NHS, our schools. Lord, we pray uh, that there would be a resolution there. And Lord, behind it, we recognise the imbalance of power and the imbalance of wealth in our country. And we pray that, that some of those uh, bigger issues would be addressed by our leaders, that there wouldn't be this uh, huge chasm of difference between the very, very rich and the very poor. And we pray for all those people who feel they're not recognised by parties or by politicians and recognise what a danger that is to our democracy. And we pray for leaders who would sincerely care for the electorate and be trying not only to uh, seek their own uh, wealth and fame and position, but recognise the needs to serve uh, their electorate. And Father, we want to pray for our city as well, and we want to recognise that public services uh, in this country are under huge strain at the moment. And we see that in all sorts of areas. And we pray for wisdom of our local council leaders as they try and deal with diminishing budgets, competing priorities, increasing costs, all of those things. We recognise what a difficult job it must be to make those decisions. And we pray for Christians involved in those decisions, that they would have wisdom and support. And we pray for this community and thank you for the witness of this church. And we continue to pray for its involvement in all sorts of areas of life. Lord, we feel a huge blessing as we recognise the sheer numbers of people coming into this building. And what a change has happened in the last few years. And we pray for all those interactions with people who may not know you. We pray that we would be a witness as a people to all those people who are coming in for whatever reason, uh, be it anything to do with uh, their faith or just hobbies or just wanting a cup of coffee and a cake. Lord, we pray for the witness of ordinary Christians in this community reaching out and demonstrating your love to this people. And this week we ask that you'd give us all opportunities to uh, describe and articulate and show your love through our actions and our words. And Lord, that your kingdom will be increased by those uh, very small things that have a big impact. Thank you that you describe the kingdom of God as like yeast permeating into bread and making a huge difference from a very small start. And we recognise that 
often we can't really imagine just what small changes we can make and opportunities that we can take that would have a huge impact and change things. And we pray that you would give us eyes to see those opportunities and grace to seize them this week. Amen. Let's sing another song before we uh, reflect on the passage. Uh, we're going to sing the song, Give Thanks, as we thank God for all the many good things he's given us. And we'll stand to sing this. passage in Matthew 18, 1 to 7, open in front of you. Please feel free to reflect on that. We're just going to spend a bit of time looking at that rather interesting interaction. It's part of a, a series I've been trying to do where I've been looking at interactions with Jesus, people who met Jesus and, and what that can tell us about Jesus, because obviously Jesus is right at the centre of our faith. And those interactions are, are incredibly insightful, I think. Um, I've got uh, two uh, children, Naomi and Josh. Uh, Naomi's 24, Josh is 21. Uh, so they're, they're kind of uh, grown-ups now. Well, they think they are. Um, uh, but uh, some years ago, um, it fell to me to help Naomi to learn to ride a bike. She had a bike and she got stabilizers on it, you know, the little wheels on the sides. And it was time. She was ready. Well, she told me she was ready to learn how to ride the bike without the stabilizers. Okay, you're already sensing a sense of trepidation. I can see some body language. Yes, yes, some of you have been there. Yeah, so, well, we live uh, in Normanton. The bottom of our street is Normanton Park. And if you know Normanton Park, it's a park with a, a one-kilometer circuit around it, almost exactly one kilometer. But it has, from the gates where we live, a nice gentle slope. So I was thinking, perfect, this is going to be great. So off came the stabilizing wheels, and we went down to the park, all four of us. And Louise said, uh, I'm going to let you get on with this. And she went for a walk around the park. So uh, Josh was standing there, and Naomi, uh, we decided to have a go at this. And so the idea was that I was going to guide her and um, run alongside her, and eventually the, the hill was going to allow her just to get going. 
and uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> she just couldn't get the hang of it at all. She, uh, she, was, she was trying and then she was getting angry and she was getting frustrated with me. Uh, and every time I let go, she slowed down and you know what happens at that point. It just doesn't work at all. Anyway, after two or three goes, I, I determined she was gonna, I was going to ask her to do it ten times. After three, I was thinking, I'm not sure this is going to work at all. And then Josh pipes up. Josh is, like I said, three years younger. And he said, uh, Daddy, can I have a go? I'm thinking, well, whatever, might as well give a go. Josh gets on the bike. Whoosh! Off he goes. <laughs> so now it's game on, isn't it? <laughs> You can imagine what's going to happen next. Sibling rivalry takes over big time. Josh is spinning around thinking this is great, you know, no problem. Naomi's fuming at this point. <laughs> Little brother's got it. So then she gets on the bike, compelled by this strong sense of rivalry, gets on, off she goes. And uh, I was left with both my kids having learned to ride a bike just as Louise comes around the corner. I was beyond smug. <laughs> Can't describe to you just how chuffed, chuffed I was. In one circuit of the uh, park and both my kids learned to ride, uh, ride a bike. Anyway, we, we laugh about that as a family because uh, obviously there were some compelling emotions going on at that point. But it was interesting that both my kids were doing what kids do. There was sibling rivalry. There was willfulness. There was frustration. Also, there was trust, learning, and a capacity to imagine how things could be a little bit different. So when Jesus talks about, uh, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's the focus of what I'd like to talk about. What is he talking about? It. What is it about children that he's trying to encapsulate and say, this is what it's like to be in the kingdom of God. What aspects of being children is he talking about? Now, a bit of context. Children in that uh, part of the world at that particular time had no rights. In fact, their, their situation could be extremely precarious. Uh, often they weren't even given a gender until they'd grown up. They were just described as it. Okay, and... Um, and there were some appalling abuses going on. The children didn't have the kind of protection that uh, we have in this country these days. Uh, and so it, it was a fairly precarious existence. So they weren't respected. They weren't given any status. So for Jesus to do that, it goes beyond what we might see as a slightly puzzling thing. You know, what about the child? Uh, it really... Uh, encroached on um, all sorts of preconceptions of children being unimportant and having no status. So when he took the child and, uh, and said, unless you become like this person, that would have been pretty groundbreaking. It would have been pretty unusual. That would have got everybody's attention at that point because they would be thinking, well, it's just a child, you know. What is it that we should be uh, trying to uh, emulate at that point? if we are to get into the kingdom of God. And what I'd like to do is just explore that a little bit. And I want to make a distinction. It's a, it's a helpful distinction, I think, between childish behaviour, which is a mark of stunted growth and people just not being mature, and childlike behaviour, which is what I think Jesus was getting at. Okay, Childish behaviour, immaturity, childlike behaviour, what Jesus, I think, was talking about. Because we've got examples in the, uh, the New Testament of uh, childish behaviour. Paul, talking about in 1 Corinthians 3, says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who, are, who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. Indeed, you are still not ready. Paul is having a bit of a go at the Corinthians, saying... They're just a bit childish. They need to grow up. So clearly that's not a pattern of behaviour that Jesus is talking about. What sort of things, when we look at children, are unhelpful characteristics? Well, anyone seen a child say the word, it's not fair? <laughs> and 
they're not really talking about a massive issues of justice at that point, aren't they? They're really saying, <clears throat> I didn't get what I wanted. That's what they mean by it's not fair. What they'd like is for the universe to conform to their wishes. Unrealistic expectations is a mark of immaturity. When children are doing that, they're basically saying, I want my own way. And that isn't what Jesus is talking about. And yet God is very, very accommodating for young Christians. I found this quote from um, a man called Jim Packer who's written a number of uh, eminent books on knowing God. And he makes these comments. God is very gentle with very young Christians, just as mothers are with very young babies. Often the start of their Christian career is marked by great emotional joy, striking providences, remarkable answers to prayer, and immediate fruitfulness in their first acts of witness. Thus God encourages them, but establishes them in the life. But as they grow stronger and are able to bear more, he exercises them in a tougher school. He exposes them to as much testing by the pressure of opposed and discouraging influences as they are able to bear. Not more, but equally not less. Thus he builds our character, strengthens our faith, and prepares us to help others. When we are young Christians, and I'm, I, I bet many of us can really exp um, appreciate this, all sorts of stuff happened, didn't it? We did feel that sense of joy. All sorts of answers to prayer. And what he's saying there is that in those early stages when we're quite childish as Christians, God is very, very accommodating. But he also wants us to grow up, to be more mature, to be able to deal with the adversities in life. Another characteristic of children is stubbornness. The child in the supermarket. <laughs> wants to walk, but is really too tired so absolutely will not get in the pushchair. So feels duty-bound to throw themselves on the floor, thumping the floor, where? By the checkout aisles, in front of everybody else. You've either seen it or you've been a parent and experienced it. That's stubbornness. And again, that's not a characteristic that Jesus is wanting us to emulate. Again, the Bible talks about that kind of attitude. The, the whole of the story of the Israelites in the wilderness is like a, a morality tale for why you don't want to be stubborn. They get talked about in this term, a stiff-necked people. That kind of stubbornness that you don't get your own way, you just have a massive strop. You're not willing to listen. Clearly not a characteristic that Jesus is talking about. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, one preacher helpfully identified a number of childlike traits that get to the heart of the passage, and I'm going to mention a couple of them. Firstly, children have no fixed preconceptions of reality. They have no fixed preconceptions of reality. They're prepared to imagine how things can be different. If you go back to that example of my kids... Josh listened to what I said, watched what was going on, and imagined I could see myself on that bike just riding along. He imagined a very different reality. And kids can do that. It's one of the reasons why stories work so well with them. It's interesting, it's the children in Spielberg's movie E.T. who accept him, whereas the adults don't. And if you're looking for a Bible example... Think about the centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant. Doesn't even need Jesus to go to his house. He just needs to say a word. And he knows that if Jesus says that word, his servant will be healed. Because he understands, he imagines that authority. He says, you know, if I ask for something from one of my subordinates, it just happens. And so he just accepts that this is Jesus. He has that power and he could do exactly the same thing. So children have no fixed preconceptions of reality. And imagine if our lives were more characterised by that. Imagine if our lives were more characterised by that. I remember hearing a story a number of years ago of a bunch of students who were doing a sociology project in the States. 
and they were looking at the Dominican Republic. And they realised that the Dominican Republic was um, dominated by two or three multinationals. And these multinationals had a really negative impact on this country. And so they wanted to do something about that. And they recognised the biggest of these was a company called Gulf and Western. And so what they did was they bought, each of these students bought one share in that company. And so off they went to the shareholders meeting because one share entitled them to speak at the shareholders meeting. And at the shareholders meeting, these students, as part of their sociology project, gave a little speech saying that the company needed to change. It was exploiting the people in the Dominican Republic and therefore it ought to change the way it operated so it was fairer and more just. And they felt pretty good about that and off they went. What they weren't prepared for was the fact that the whole board of this, com this company were completely smitten by this challenge. And the company instituted huge changes to the way that they operated in that country. And as a result of that, a lot of those inequities were challenged by that, com by that company and changed. Imagine if we were the kind of people who, as I was praying earlier, were thinking perhaps the status quo doesn't need to be the status quo. Perhaps I can do a few little things like a little speech in a meeting like those students did that could have a massive, massive impact under God's grace and really change the status quo. What would it be like if we prayed for those opportunities that the status quo that we see at the moment might change and that we might be part of that as those students were? So that's the first thing I think Jesus is looking for when he talks about a childlike faith. A recognition that the status quo doesn't need to be the status quo and that the Holy Spirit can use our actions to change things dramatically. Secondly, children know how to trust. I remember again, talking about my kids, this seems to be coming a lot today. You remember those, uh, those, those times when the kids are so small that you can just chuck them in the air and catch them? You know, and you think, wow, that seems a bit dangerous now. <laughs> Were they frightened? No, they were normally laughing and giggling and shrieking. Such was their fun, sense of fun at that uh, experience. At no point did uh, they, it cross their minds that there was any kind of danger. It was complete and utter trust. Walking across uh, along a busy road. They don't worry about the cars because they're with their mum and dad. That sense of trust. What does that look like? Well, recently I came across the story of a missionary called Walter Cizek. I don't know if any of you have come across him before. Uh, Walter Cizek was a devout Catholic uh, who was from Pennsylvania. And he joined a Jesuit mission and volunteered for service in Soviet Russia at the height of its kind of Stalinist era um, prior to the Second World War. He spoke the language, that was one of the reasons he volunteered for that. But instead of, instead of sending him to Russia, his superior signed him instead to Poland. And he was, I have no idea why I'm going to Poland. I'm clearly called by God to go to Russia. And there he was in Poland, stuck there because the church had said that's where he needed to go. Well, God clearly had other plans because a few years later war broke out. Hitler's army invaded Poland. Cizek saw an opportunity at that point. There were a whole pile of Polish refugees who were all fleeing into Russia. And he decided to disguise himself as a worker and he joined the refugees and sneaked into Russia where he'd always wanted to serve. And he thought, great. Prayer's been answered. I can see God's actions. Shortly afterwards, he was arrested by the KGB. He spent the next five years in solitary confinement in the notorious Libyanka prison in Moscow. Constant harassment, interrogation. Again, he was asking huge questions. What is God playing at? 
Why am I in solitary confinement when clearly I want to minister to people? I feel called to Russia. I do not understand what God is playing at. Finally, he caved in after many, many interrogations to the KGB's demands. He wrote a confession of his spying activities. He refused to cooperate further and he was sentenced to 15 years hard labour in Siberia. In Siberia's much harsher conditions of fierce cold and 14-hour workdays, Cezek got at last the chance to serve as a priest after gradually winning the confidence of Ukrainian Catholics. He took risks, endured punishment and pursued God. One by one, all remnants of the childish faith fell away. In the place grew a mature yet childlike faith. And he wrote about his experience. He says, by faith we know that God is present everywhere and is always present to us if we but turn to him. So it is we who must put ourselves in God's presence. We who must turn to him in faith. We who must leap beyond an image to the belief, indeed the realisation that we are in the presence of a loving Father who stands always ready to listen to our childish stories and to answer our childlike trust. So, how do we be more childlike? It's actually harder, I think, as you grow, uh, grow older, isn't it? Those of us who have been Christians a long time sometimes find this whole way of reimagining and trusting difficult. And that's because many of us have experienced tragedies and disappointments and life hasn't always turned out as we imagined it. We are not immune to the same problems that everybody else in the population has. Christians die at approximately the same rate as everybody else. The statistics don't lie. One death per person. So, how do we navigate life's dramas and difficulties. Well, earlier in the uh, service, we read a psalm, Psalm 57. And that is a psalm that, if you look at the little notes, is all about when David was on the run. David's life, I think, is a little bit instructive because early life of David, it was very much like that kind of young Christian thing. He had been spectacularly successful. He was nimble, he was athletic, he was gifted. Um, he, he bursts onto the stage dispatching Goliath that everybody else was afraid of military victories follow and you just think this guy is destined for spectacular greatness and yet God had other plans years in the wilderness hunted as an outlaw a price on his head assassins sent out to kill him how did David retain his childlike trust in God's capacity to change things. And the psalm we read out earlier gives us some insights. I wonder if we could put it up, would that be okay? Uh, which one? Uh, 57. So David, starts by bringing his current reality to God doesn't sugarcoat it he's in trouble so he starts by being really really honest with God by talking about his struggles by naming those struggles he is in a very dark place there are no guarantees he knows that God has a plan but now he realizes that that doesn't necessarily mean he's not going to struggle through that plan so he starts by talking about his current reality. If we could just move on to the next bit, please. Thank you. And then he um, reminds himself of God's protection and care in the past. And again, that's something is a discipline that we can do, isn't it? We can name our issues, our problems. We can talk about them honestly with God then we can remind ourselves of God's protection and care in the past. Think about those times when God has blessed us, where God has taken us out of difficult situations, where God has intervened, where God has walked alongside us. 
And finally, he reminds himself of who God is, his character. He talks about the greatness of God. He tells himself about God. Those three things. Current reality, a reminder of the past and God's protection, and a reminder of who God is. And if you go through the Psalms, one of the interesting things about the Psalms, I think, is that a good 50% of the Psalms are actually quite wintry in tone. They start in some dark places. And yet, 449 out of the 150 always end up with a sense of hope. And it's like the writers, some of, David wrote some of them, there were other writers as well, you'd probably be aware of. Wherever they started, they ended up with a sense of hope. There was that reality at the beginning, life is not easy, life is difficult sometimes, but we still have this sense of hope. So let's conclude. One of the best examples, I think, of childlike faith is Peter walking on water. I love this story. I think we give Peter a bit of a hard time. He was a fisherman, and that meant they knew just how dangerous the water was. It's a small lake, but sudden storms could cause havoc. And everybody in that boat would have known people who had drowned. Fathers and sons who'd not come back. Widows and dependents left trying to make a living, supported by relatives. So they had a healthy respect for choppy waters. These guys were experts at that and they knew just how dangerous this place could be. But Peter does something remarkable. He sees Jesus in the distance, walking on the water, and says, if it's you, ask me to come out and walk on the water. And he does exactly that, doesn't he? Just for a few steps. And then, of course, it all falls apart, and he falls in, and he gets saved by Jesus. But it's... I wonder if you met Peter afterwards and asked him what he thought, what he remembered of that, that what he took away from that. Would he not say... For a few moments, I trusted Jesus and I walked on water. That would be the thing I think that he would take away from that. That he exercised that childlike trust, that he believed that he could walk on water. The status quo that said he was going to sink might not be true. God might be able to do something special. And Jesus is somebody that I can trust. So for a few steps, he walked on water. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, we thank you for this remarkable interaction with this small child. And we pray that we would be able to take away some of these childlike characteristics. Lord, help us to imagine how life could be different. Help us to be prepared for you to shake up the status quo. Help us to see opportunities where a small action on our part that you've created for us by your Holy Spirit might have a disproportionately large impact because of something that you are planning and that you want to do. Please prevent us be, from being the kind of people who put things on a hold when we have these opportunities. Help us to step out, as Peter did, metaphorically, and trust you, and imagine that there might be something different, and recognise that you are utterly trustworthy. In your son's precious name, amen. Amen. Let's sing a song together. We're going to sing Be Thou My Vision, as we remind ourselves of who God is, and that vision that he represents and hopefully forget sometimes about the things that stop us exercising that kind of faith. Let's stand and sing this together.
with us this week as we go out into our different jobs and our neighbourhoods and our communities. And bless us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.